Good afternoon. My name is Tyler Sams. I'm the preacher for the Judson Road Church of Christ in Longview, Texas. Thank you for joining me this afternoon as we continue our study on the gospel sermons that are presented in the book of Acts. And today our study takes us to the transition point between Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7. We'll be focusing on one of the men who was identified earlier in chapter 6, a man by the name of Stephen. He's going to present a uh, very broad gospel sermon that is recorded in its entirety in Acts chapter 7. But before we get there, because it is such a a long sermon, we're going to try to break it up into two parts. And in this study, we're going to do a lot of background work on Stephen and what led to his gospel sermon. And so if you've got your New Testament with you, I invite you to open up to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, and that's where we're going to get started this afternoon in our study on Stephen's Gospel Sermon. And like we've been doing with all of these studies, let's begin first with this question. Why is Stephen speaking? Well, as we have noted, and as you might remember from last week, previously Stephen was appointed as one of these special servants of the Jerusalem church. You remember there had been a complaint that had arose by some of the Hellenistic Jews because uh, they perceived that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And so the apostles summoned together the the entire congregation there at Jerusalem and asked them to select seven men from among themselves who could devote themselves to the work of taking care of these needy widows so that the apostles could devote themselves to their more... uh, spiritual work. That, that's not to say that what these seven men would be doing was, was somehow inferior to what the apostles would be doing, but it was just a, a different sort of service, tending to the physical needs of people, whereas the apostles would be uh, more truly keen in on the spiritual needs of people. And among the seven who were selected by the congregation was a man named Philip. We read there in chapter 6 and verse 5 that he was a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And when you come down a bit further in chapter 6, we find out just a little bit more about Stephen, that he in verse 8 was full of grace and full of power and was performing great wonders and signs among the people. And so you have this this character, Stephen, noted for being full of grace, power, faith, and the Holy Spirit. He seems kind of like an ideal servant of God. And so here he is, and after what happened with the the widows there in Jerusalem and being taken care of, apparently the gospel is still spreading there in Jerusalem. And as you read in chapter 6 and verse 7, the word of God kept on spreading. And the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And then notice this last phrase. A great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And so you have people who, some of whom would have been the most schooled individuals in the law of Moses. Those who had their livelihood drawn from the law of Moses are now following the law of Moses to its proper conclusion and are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And as you can imagine, for those who were refusing Jesus and those who were uh, adamantly embracing uh, Judaism, this posed a problem. And so we see in in verses 8 and 9 that Stephen is, is continuing to wax bold in the gospel. He is also working signs and wonders among the people. And this has got the attention then in verse 9 of men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia. And they rose up and they argued with Stephen. Why might they be arguing with Stephen? Well, he's full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, full of grace, full of power, performing miracles. And connected with all of this is what we see there in verse 7, that the word of God is growing and spreading. It seems like Stephen is playing at least a small role in that. Stephen has a target on his back. He's part of the enemy. He's perceived as part of the problem uh, by the Jewish elites. And so he has to be dealt with. 
but they're struggling dealing with him. In verse 10, they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And so if you can't answer someone's argument, what do you do? Well, you lie about them. And indeed, this is just exactly what happened to Stephen. In verse 11, they, that is those from verse 9, those from the synagogue of the freedmen, they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Pause for just a moment and think about this. These are people who were supposed to be devotees to the law of Moses. These are people who are rejecting Jesus because in their minds he does not fit what Moses promised in the law that the Messiah was going to be. And so in order to overturn and defeat those who were aligning themselves with the Christ, what do these Jews do? Verse 11, they secretly induced men to say falsehoods. That's bearing false witness, isn't it? That's a violation of the law of Moses. That's a violation of one of the Ten Commandments. This is the opposition that Stephen was facing. Men who seem to have had no scruples whatsoever about gaining the end that they had in mind. And so continuing reading there in verse 12, they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him. And they dragged Stephen away and brought him before the council. And they put forward false witnesses who said, This man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. And the high priest said, Are these things so? And so Stephen, uh, pulled before something resembling a trial here, is invited to give a defense of himself. And that's just exactly what's going to happen in chapter 7. Stephen is going to give a, a defense of himself, a defense of the gospel, a defense of Jesus Christ rooted in the scriptures of the Old Testament. And as we come forward into chapter 7 next week, we're going to see that Stephen's audience did not take to that very well. But before we get there, we need to talk about just that. To whom is Stephen speaking? Who is his audience? And as you look there at chapter 6 and in verse 15, we find that Stephen is speaking to the council, chapter 7 and verse 1, that council includes the high priest. This seems to be just exactly what we talked about a few weeks ago. This is the Sanhedrin, uh, the group of, of 70 Jewish leaders, which included the high priest and several other uh, priests, scribes, people like that. Influential Jewish leaders. Stephen is set before them and instructed to give a defense of himself. This is all, of course, taking place, it seems, in Jerusalem, going back to chapter 6 and verse 7, the word of God kept on spreading and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And really up until we get to chapter 8 verses 1 through 4, we're really focusing on Jerusalem as the epicenter of everything happening to this point in the book of Acts. It's going to be after chapter 7, after the conclusion of Stephen's sermon, that a persecution is going to arise against the Christians. And in chapter 8 and verse 4, those who were scattered, went everywhere preaching the word. Christians are going to be driven out of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. Uh, the apostles notably are going to remain, but others are going to scatter. But up until we get to chapter 8 and verse 4, really the focus in the book of Acts is in Jerusalem. And so here is where Stephen is, coming back to chapter 6 and 7. He's in Jerusalem, and he is about to give a defense before the Sanhedrin of himself of the gospel that he is sharing, and of the Christ whom he serves. You notice the language there in chapter 6, uh, verses 12 through 14. This isn't Stephen, uh, you know, cordially agreeing to come and appear before this council. This is Stephen uh, being dragged in verse 12 before this council. False accusations piling up against him. Hands are laid on him. He is dragged before the council. But in verse 15, as they stare at him, they saw his face like the face of an angel. 
Now, what exactly that means, I don't exactly know. Could it be that it was bright? Could it be that it was radiant and resilient? Something happened, and people are taken aback. And you see almost a shift in tone with the high priest, as in verse 1, he says, are these things. So he doesn't proceed to immediately charge Stephen. He seems to be very careful in his dealings with him. And so he offers Stephen the opportunity to defend himself. He is on trial for the accusations of the false witnesses. Again, the question there, are these things so? Well, what were the charges that had been laid against him? Well, as you look there in chapter 6 and in verse 11, men were induced to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And then coming down to verse 13, he incessantly speaks against this holy place and against the law. We have heard him say that this Nazarene, Jesus, will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And so the accusations, he speaks against this holy place. He speaks against the law. We heard him say Jesus will destroy this place and that he will alter the customs of Moses. Those are the charges that are laid down against him. Do those charges sound familiar? Well, if you've been reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, certainly those charges sound familiar. Those are very similar t charges to those that were laid down at the feet of Jesus. And here's a question I want to ask you. What might Stephen have said to incite such a response, to, to prompt Jews to bear false witness to say, we heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses, against God, against the holy place, against the law, that Jesus would destroy this place and that he would alter the customs which Moses handed down. What could Stephen have said that could have lit such a fire under the feet of Stephen's Jewish opponents here? And while we don't know exactly, perhaps we could make some educated guesses. Come back with me to John chapter 2 in your New Testaments. John chapter 2. Perhaps it is that Stephen quoted the words of Jesus from John chapter 2 about his resurrection when the Jews were accusing Stephen of speaking against this holy place. Do you remember what Jesus said in John chapter 2 and in verse 19? Speaking with the Jews, Jesus said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews took that to mean Jesus was talking about the temple, which had been some 40-odd years in the building. Would you rebuild it in three days? And of course, that's not what Jesus was talking about. John chapter 2 and verse 21, John adds for us, He was speaking of the temple of his body. And in verse 22, When therefore Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture. And the words what Jesus had spoken, is it possible that Stephen quoted the words of Jesus here in John chapter 2 and verse 19 about his own personal bodily resurrection, but like they did when Jesus originally said it, here you have some Jews who uh, took the wrong interpretation of what Stephen said and used it to form some sort of threat of violence against the temple. That might have been what Stephen said. He might have been quoting the words of Jesus in John chapter 2. He might have been quoting the words of Jesus in, in Luke chapter 21. Since Luke and Acts are companion letters, perhaps it is that Stephen was quoting from the words of Jesus from Luke chapter 21 about the judgment that was to come upon Jerusalem. If in Acts chapter 6 and verse 13... Uh, the, the charge that was laid against Stephen was that he was speaking against this holy place of the temple. John 2, 19 might come into play. If the idea is that he was speaking against this holy place, meaning Jerusalem, perhaps then it was that Stephen was quoting from Luke chapter 21, where Jesus talks about the judgment that was going to come upon Jerusalem. Look at, for example, Luke chapter 21 and verse 20. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is at hand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of the city depart. And let not those who are in the country enter the city, because these are days of vengeance, in order that all things which are written may be fulfilled. 
Is that possibly what Stephen had quoted that kindled the ire and the wrath of these Jews? Where they could make up this false, this false accusation that Stephen was speaking against this holy place, Jerusalem? It's possible. They also, in Acts chapter 6 and verse 13, accused Stephen of speaking against the law. Go just a few chapters earlier in Acts to Acts chapter 2. They accused Stephen of speaking against the law of Moses. Jesus never spoke against the law of Moses. Jesus promised that he did not come to destroy the law of Moses, but to fulfill it. Paul preached from the law of Moses and showed that Jesus Christ was the logical fulfillment and the logical end of the law of Moses. Peter would do the same thing. And I think it's safe to assume that, that the apostles taught that consistently. But here is Stephen. And here is Stephen being charged with speaking and preaching and teaching against the law. Do you think maybe he quoted the words of Paul, or Peter rather, excuse me. Do you think maybe he quoted the words of Peter in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36 when Peter said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ? You know, in that passage, what is Peter saying? Jesus is the Messiah. But the council to whom Stephen was about to give testimony, they certainly didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah. Could it be that Stephen had quoted the words of Peter and that is what raised the ire of the Jews that were around him? Or in chapter 6 and verse 14, they accused Stephen of altering the customs. I'm still there in Acts chapter 2, but I'm looking at verse 38 where Peter said to the audience that had been cut to their heart, Repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Do you know what's not mentioned in that text? There's nothing about the sacrifice of a ram or a goat, a bull, an ox. There's nothing about going to an earthly priest and having a sacrifice made on your behalf, is there? There's simply the promise of what? Forgiveness through Jesus Christ on the basis of belief, repentance, and baptism. That's different than the law of Moses, though it is certainly something to which the law of Moses testified. I don't know exactly what Stephen might have said that could have incited such a response from the Sanhedrin, but if we look at some of the words of Jesus and some of the words of Peter in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, it's not too difficult to find something that the Jews could have twisted and used as an accusation against Stephen. And so in chapter 7 and verse 1, the high priest is going to invite Stephen to give a defense of himself. Are these things so? And Lord willing, that's what we'll be talking about in our study next week. We'll be looking very in-depth at what Stephen had to say is a defense of himself, a defense of the Christ, and a defense of the gospel. But as we have been doing in this study, we want to talk about some preaching points. Some preaching points that we see here in Acts chapter 6 and transitioning into chapter 7 that might be helpful to us, whether as preachers or as Christians in congregations where we're hearing preaching week in and week out and, and wanting to make sure that our preaching matches up to the preaching that we see in the New Testament. And perhaps one thing that we can use as a source of comfort to, to all of us, whether preachers or not, is that it doesn't take a miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit to be full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, do you remember there in Acts chapter 6 and verse 5, Stephen is described as a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. But if you'll notice, it's not until chapter 6 and verse 6 that the apostles lay their hands on Stephen and these six other men. And then it's in chapter 6 and verse 8, after the apostles lay hands on them, that Stephen is recorded as working miracles. I think one thing that might say to us is, is that, look, it doesn't we don't have to have the ability to work miracles in order to be useful in the service of God. We can be full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit and, and never work a miracle, and that's okay. That's okay. 
Being full of the Holy Spirit isn't just about working miracles. Being full of the Holy Spirit is about taking the Spirit's message and internalizing it, making it a part of who we are and living out His message. That, in fact, is what Paul is talking about in Galatians chapter 5 when he says if we're going to live in the Spirit, we ought to walk or line up with the Spirit. We can be full of the Holy Spirit today by listening to what the Holy Spirit says and by doing what the Holy Spirit says. How about this? Here's another preaching point. That you and I could be full of grace and faith and power in the Holy Spirit and we could still find ourselves surrounded by enemies and hardship. Isn't that just exactly what Stephen experiences here? He he has given this this resounding introduction to us in verse 5, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, full of grace, full of power. And then in verse 9, he has enemies. And in verse 11, there's false testimony being offered against him. And in verse 12, hands are laid on him and he is dragged away before the council. And then in chapter 7, he's going to be killed. A man who was full of grace, faith, power, and the Holy Spirit loses his life. I think it's a great message to us that we shouldn't judge our spiritual standing by our physical circumstances. You've got Stephen who endures just perhaps one of the most traumatic events any of us could ever envision. And immediately at the end of that trauma, he's going to heaven. We need to make sure that we're not judging ourselves on the basis of physical circumstance. We could be full of grace, faith, power, and the Holy Spirit and still find ourselves surrounded by enemies and hardships. We could even find ourselves facing death. But that doesn't mean somehow our spiritual service to God is lacking. How about this as well? Some will find fault with whatever we say even if the words belong to Jesus. I don't know what Stephen might have said to where people could twist his words into saying that he spoke words against Moses, against God, against the law, against the holy place, and against the customs which Moses handed down. But I, could, I can see them doing the same thing to Jesus. And if Stephen is a man full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith, I think he would be acquainted with the words of Jesus, the words of Peter. And if he's saying those things, if he's teaching, using those words and phrases and quotes, if they twisted the words of Peter, if they twisted the words of Jesus, don't you think they would twist the words of Stephen? And if they would do it to Jesus and Peter and Stephen, don't you think sometimes it might happen to us? It ought to be a lesson to us that we ought to try to speak as clearly as we can, but it also ought to be a lesson to us that we ought to be very careful when we're getting second and third and fourth hand information that before we go and form our own conclusions and draw judgments, we ought to make sure that we're dealing with the facts. Because the facts that the Sanhedrin had as they sat Stephen before them were wrong. And then finally, we ought to be prepared to endure hardship. And that even in the midst of that hardship, we ought not abandon what we know is right. Stephen probably doesn't know it. But he's going to preach one of the most seminal gospel sermons in the New Testament. And then mere moments after he ends, he's going to be killed. He's going to be treated brutally. And he's going to die. But he doesn't give up. He doesn't abandon what he knows is right. He doesn't stop teaching. He doesn't stop preaching He doesn't wave the white flag of surrender. He knows what is true. He stands by what is true. And he has confidence in God both as a redeemer and as a deliverer. His dying words there in chapter 7, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. But what a comfort to have the consolation of hope and of heaven.
Stephen didn't abandon what he knew was right. He endured hardship as a good soldier, and he received the reward. There's a lot to learn from the life of Stephen. I'm glad you joined me for this study today, and Lord willing, we'll be back next week to look more in depth at what Stephen had to say in Acts chapter 7. But until then, I hope you have a great week, and we'll talk to you soon.